Yes. One of the other residents. So I'm going to be presenting the case of CW. This is a 56-year-old male. Has had recurrent urinary tract infections and urinary retention. He um, has undergone at an outside facility a transfer resource section of the prostate. Um, unfortunately, after that, he still had uh, urinary retention. And so he had a bladder neck incision done, again, without any improvement. So they started him on... Um, intermittent catheterization, and then um, he said that he was still able to void some, but only 40 to 50 mLs at the time, and he never felt that he was ever completely empty. <laughs> at this point, he was referred to us for further management. He had a history of these chronic urinary tract infections. They were culture-proven um, and had, he said, responded to um, antibiotics. He did have sleep apnea. He had seasonal allergies. His only past medical history was, I'm sorry, surgical history, was the previous two um, uh, procedures done on his prostate. So he's not allergic to anything. He was on uh, prophylactic antibiotics and some medication for his um, seasonal allergies. He had a family history of uh, cholangiocarcinoma and esophageal cancer. He was a retired military engineer. Um, never any alcohol, drug, or um, illicit drug abuse. So on exam, he had a normal sphincter tone. He had a 25-gram prostate. It was not um, tender. There were no nodules. His post residual, and this was based on a bladder scan, was 161. His laboratory um, creatinine was 1.3. Gave him a GFR of 57. His urine culture, when he presented to us, was negative. So we have a 57-year-old male with persistent urinary retention. He's had a TERP and a bladder neck incision. He's now in intermittent catheterization. How would you um, want to manage him? Back to your first slide. He was how old now? He is 56. No, before he, before he, he was 52 when he got his TUR. Is that it, what you're telling me? Yes. Just that he was having difficulty voiding and felt that he wasn't completely empty. I don't have a euro flow on him from what the. What is the probability that a 52 year old has sufficient urinary symptoms to justify a TURP? Mm. Well, I probably wouldn't just based on his symptoms do a TURP. Is that what you're asking? Is I would there have. Is there a family history of multiple sclerosis? There is not. We have no family history because, of that. Uh, multiple sclerosis is one of the most common mm -hmm. cause. This has happened in female, but male are not of uh, any. Yeah. Avoid. It's acceptable, acceptable people with multiple sclerosis. Mm -hmm. I diagnose them mm -hmm. with urinary well, retention. And what the, the point that's being made here, I'm sorry, I mm -hmm. um, is if you were in my clinic and you came to me and proposed this operation, um, I would say, why, mm -hmm. what evidence do you have you even have obstruction? Because quite frankly, 52-year-old is way too young for this diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So I would want to know what exactly was his history. And mm -hmm. I'll ask the medical student who's back in the corner hiding from me. Um, <laughs> what are the two questions? That's a what am I thinking question. What do you want to really know about his voiding history? A couple, I'll give you a couple. Any idea? I mean, urgency. Something even more basic. And I'll give you the answer, because I go after medical students all the time. So how many times do you urinate during the daytime, and how many times do you urinate at night? And I ask that, because then the next question is, what's normal? And I won't put you on the spot, because I, when I give this lecture to the medical students, I do go around the room and ask, how many times do you go? You go, you go, you go, you go. <laughs> and we very quickly realize that the average person goes about three, four, five times a day. And the young people in the crowd, which are all the medical students, never get up at night. I let them know that after 50, you begin to get up once. And after 60, it's one to two. And after 70, it's two. And I won't put Stu Howard's on the spot, but I know he's in the room. Sometimes he gets up at night, but it is normal to go increasing. So the question becomes, what was it about this history that made someone think of obstruction? Because I would say the likelihood of obstruction is very low. Mm -hmm. And that if I cannot get a good history, I will insist on the, one of the cheapest tests known to men, but it's called a voiding diary. 
where you actually send the patient home and ask, please record how much came out each time. Do you know how much should come out of a normal void? These are the these are the numbers I start my medical students at. Because if you don't have a handle on this, you haven't a clue whether somebody is going four times at night, whether they have to or not. And the bottom line is 300, 350. So if he's urinating four times a day, I want to know is it 300 cc's with each void? If he's getting out three times a night, if it's putting out 300 cc's with each void at night, I know he doesn't have obstruction. He's got an obstoria, but terp is not the answer. So again. I think the, the diagnosis was missed back at age 52. And since I don't have the history of those numbers, I don't know whether I want to walk down the neurogenic pathway mm -hmm. uh, or something else like that, because if, if the decision to do the TERP was based in nocturia, my first question is, how many times were you getting up at night and what void? If he was putting out 300 cc's, I would have asked how much fluid he took in. Did he have diabetes insipidus? Was he having a, a, a nocturnal diuresis because of cardiac disease? Mm -hmm. So I don't know if the turf was done because of the nocturia, which is often what happens. And I see more medical people make the diagnosis and put somebody on Flomax for this, and they didn't even bother to check the guy's putting out a liter and a half over in the night. So without that information, we don't know what's going on. But if I don't get a good answer based on history, and you can get a lot of history when you really probe, he would have gone off to your analysis. Which is exactly what we said. That's what I figured you were taking me, but I wanted to yeah. say the urodynamics should have been done long before. It should have been done before the TARP, certainly, before he went under any procedure. And that showed us what? So <laughs> this was our um, urodynamics. It's actually fairly interesting. Um, we were not able to elicit any um, detrusor contractions from him. There's a couple of times you see here, they tried to adjust the urethrocatheter. He said he felt full and tried to avoid multiple times, um, but just was unable How full to. did you get him? They um, got him to 580 before they stopped. Uh, they thought there was some increased compliance. He didn't have any leakage, so no stress urinary incontinence. But again, no apparent detrusor contractions. And again, going back to history, which I would have done at age 52, I would have asked questions like, any trouble walking? Mm -hmm. Any trouble climbing stairs? Any change in your bowel habits? Because mm -hmm. those are the simplest questions to ask to immediately move from a prostate-centric diagnosis to we got a neurologic disaster on our hands. Yes. And I can't tell you how many patients have gone from my clinic off to the neurologist to work up a neurologic problem here. But you got a flaccid bladder, and so my question is, did he have answers to any of those questions? Well, with this, he actually got video. All right. So it does give us some extra information. So we have the bladder, and as you'll notice, there is um, a little extra contour of a very large yeah. diverticulum. So he has diverticular steel. Um, so now I have a 56-year-old male with urinary retention, a large diverticulum, um, who is unable to void. So. so the question is, was he void with that diverticulum, or did he get it over 50 years of dysfunctional voiding? Mm -hmm. Tony will probably tell you all about that, whether he wasn't opening up his bladder neck. So on that video, did his bladder neck open? Though I guess after the QRP, it's harder to tell. But can you, can you do we see any open? But he never had a contraction, so he never had a normal void. Right? Yeah, he never avoided. So he probably popped off this diverticulum early on because he was probably all of his life either straining to void or either from his detrusor. No, he doesn't have a lot more ticks. Mm -mm, just uh, that one very he large used his detrusor, But I bet you when you go back and talk to him, has he been having trouble avoiding all of his life? And it just got a little worse by age 52? Mm -hmm. okay, that is the history that he gets. So we took him to the OR, did an open bladder, um, excision of a bladder diverticulum. Uh, what, what did you tell him you would achieve by that? We were hoping um, if we took away the bladder diverticulum, um, we told him that we had no guarantee that he could void. Because of the urodynamics, we didn't know if he had a flaccid bladder, if uh, the trusher was actually going to contract. We had a feeling that it would um, because we didn't have any other reason that we didn't have diabetes or anything like that. He'd had no neurological symptoms. We did ask him about all that. He had no trouble walking, no trouble with bowel movements or anything like that. Um, so we were hoping when we closed it that he had to do certain contractions. Now the reason we didn't see him on your dynamics is because it's just a probe in the middle of his bladder. It's not actually in the detrusor muscle. So you can't see if that detrusor is actually trying to contract or not. All you can tell is that there's no pressure differential between the abdomen and the bladder. And, and, and I don't fault you at all for sizing his diverticulum, though he hasn't had problems with recurrent infections. It will make it easier for him to drain his bladder. But I would make sure I told this guy, 
in terms of expectations post-surgery. Um, let me back up a little bit. Did he have any sensation his bladder was full? Yes, he right, so constantly felt full. Right, so that's a start. So you, so you got sensory feedback. You just don't know if you have motor feedback mm -hmm. or motor connection. Mm -hmm. So excising the diverticulum, um, <clears throat> no problem there. But I would tell him there's still a very good chance he's going to be on intermittent catheterization afterwards and probably for the rest of his life. Unless we can figure out the neurologic reason for it, because the truth of cancer got it. And he did, of course, go home with the Foley for two weeks, came back um, for a cystogram, which shows um, did you do a, no. Did you do a, did you do a, um, a urinary study post? Um, we did not. This was not. Uh, that it was would be for academic reasons, mm -hmm. not for practicals. Either he avoided or he didn't. He did. He has been able to avoid. Um, so he's uh, followed up with us. We've actually lost him to follow up, so we only know what happened um, initially. So initially, he was able to avoid that difficulty. He did still have a PPR of 60. Uh, is that normal or not? Oh, uh, under 100, I don't get too concerned normally, but it's a little bit high, I would think. No. Did he have an urge to go when you asked him to pee? When we asked him to pee, he did. Because if you ask someone to urinate and they don't have a strong desire to urinate, they're not as efficient. And you mm -hmm. can see a post sport residual of 60, I don't even worry about it. Or even yeah. spot them up to 100. Um, a little different if they have a strong urge to boil. Um, I'd still be worried about this guy, and I still would probably bring him in six months from now, because I don't think we'd answer the question of what his fundamental disease was. And maybe the TURP has allowed him to open his bladder neck, but I'd be curious about his morning pressures. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you haven't gotten a follow up, um, and you, you left him on Tangelosin? No, we took him off the. the uh, Again, the this is. Um, is this one of Bill's patients? No, sir. I prefer the Bill. And, uh, <laughs> and, and have him uh, consider a post uh, urinary study because I mean, if he's voiding well now, I wouldn't rest in my laurels. I'd worry about, in fact, these are abnormal high pressure voiding, mm -hmm. and will he blow out of that particular again? Again. Mm -hmm. and so, uh, and if the answer is no to that, then I think he's going to ask much more easily. It's, inter it's interesting to try to figure out where he got the data to come to begin with. Well, as I said, if, you've been, if you really probe and ask this guy, has he been having trouble voiding for his 30s and 40s? I wouldn't be surprised if he had. Have been having problems much longer than then eventually a lot of diverticular, which relieve the, the pressure of the water. Mm -hmm. yes. Spun diverticulum, did you do the case? No, I didn't get to Who got to do that? So, it was uh, a former. 30 former years ago, I seen a patient here, a young lady, she couldn't urinate. And she had all pain in the back, but she turned out some kind of disc protrusion, mm -hmm. which usually doesn't cause any pain. And of course, after that, they took care of her hair. She didn't have any more problems. Circular disproclusion is one of the rarest things can cause urinary retention. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, well, it's um, actually time.